May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is a portion of the epistle lesson read earlier. Recall your attention to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 where we read as follows that portion of God's word which will be the sermon text. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So far the text. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, the one whose blood cleanses us from all sin. Dear fellow sinners and creatures of the one true, only living, creating, and preserving triune God. This text talks about godliness. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to define that today. What is godliness? What does the Bible call godliness? What does it mean when it talks about the godly people? Well, if there are godly people, there must also be ungodly people. If there's godliness, there must also be ungodliness. So let's begin by defining ungodliness. What does it mean to be ungodly? Because there are only those two kinds of people in the world. There are godly people and there are ungodly people. Now, the Bible defines the ungodly this way. These are people who indulge in their, quote, worldly lusts. They are controlled by their worldly lusts. Their worldly lusts bring them, lead them around through their life like little puppy dogs. They follow their worldly lusts, their master that controls their life, their worldly lusts. Not God. They are ungodly. They're out of harmony with God. In fact, according to the Bible, they think God has gypped them. If they think of God at all, they think, why hasn't God given me more to indulge my worldly lusts? Why don't I have more? Why don't I have the things that I don't have? They are discontent. They are dissatisfied with what God has given them. They are unthankful for what God has given them. Let's say an ungodly person is a salesman. That's his job. He's a salesman. Well, if he's an ungodly salesman, then he's not happy with what he sold last week. He thinks God should have given him more sales last week. Or let's say that this ungodly person is a, an assembly line worker. He works in a factory. But he's ungodly, and therefore he thinks, God should have made me the foreman. God should have made me the supervisor. God should have made me the boss. He's discontent just being an assembly line worker. Or let's say that this ungodly person is a teacher. But this person is discontent being a teacher. They want to be the principal. Or if they're the principal, they're discontent and they want to be the superintendent. But they're never satisfied. They're never content. The ungodly. The Bible tells us about such a man. His name was Achan. It happened when the Israelites were being led into the promised land of Canaan under, Jer under uh, Joshua. And the first city that they came across in the Promised Land was Jericho. 
city of the Canaanites, the heathen. Now, you have to understand that God had been working with the Canaanites for hundreds and hundreds of years. That Abraham had lived there, Isaac had lived there, Jacob had lived there. For a long time, God had worked on them and tried to bring them to the truth of God's word of salvation. But the Canaanites stubbornly refused and held on, clung to their worldly gods. And so finally God says enough is enough and he leads the Israelites in to take over their land of Canaan. Under Joshua, the Israelites go to Jericho first, the first city that they come to in Canaan. And God gave them very strict orders. He said, when you have captured Jericho, and I will give you the victory over the Canaanites, I want you to destroy, utterly destroy every man, woman, and child, and animal, everything living in Jericho. I have devoted them to destruction. And all of their property, all of their gold and silver and bronze and iron and all of these things that they have, all of their treasures, are sacred unto me. I want you to put them into the treasury of the Lord. So God gave the Israelites victory over Jericho, you know, where he caused the walls to fall down. And then, after they had captured Jericho... God says, all right, now move on down the road to the next city of the Canaanites, which is Ai. And attack Ai. Well, they attack Ai. But, lo and behold, surprisingly, they don't win the battle. They lose the battle disastrously. And they don't capture Ai. The Canaanites defeat the Israelites. And Joshua is wondering, what's going on here? And God communicates to Joshua the reason they could not take Ai. God says, I told you when you took Jericho that all of the spoil, all of the treasure of Jericho was to go into my treasury. It was sacred to the Lord. But not all of it went into the treasury of the Lord. Someone kept part of it. And then God revealed to Joshua who it was. And his name was Achan. The Israelite Achan had kept some of the treasure he found in Jericho and had hidden it. Well, Achan was an ungodly man. He loved the things of this world more than God. And it cost Israel a disastrous defeat. It cost his nation many deaths in battle. And it cost his family their destruction. Because... God ordered Joshua to have Achan and his whole family stoned to death. Ungodliness. Ungodliness leads to disaster. Satan has always used this big lie very effectively with human beings ever since Adam and Eve. Don't be content with what you have. You could have more. God could give you more if he wanted to. But you see, God just doesn't want to. He used it with Eve, and it worked, and it cast the whole creation into sin, and destruction ultimately. And he's used it very effectively with people ever since. He tells people, you will find happiness if you get more worldly things. 
more than what God has given you will make you happy. Well, the Bible says that's a lie. Not only that, your own experience in life tells you it's a lie. More things do not bring you happiness. Oh, there's a brief thrill when you get them. Oh, sure. That's why you want them. You want that brief thrill that you get. But you does, it doesn't last. When you get what your worldly lust had set its heart upon, finally it says, well, that doesn't satisfy me. I want something more. And so it goes on in life. From one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Your heart simply transfers its desires from the thing you got to something else. Now I want that. In other words, it's like a drug. It's like a drug addict. When the drug addict first starts out taking his drug... There's a moment of serenity. There's a moment of uplift. There's a thrill of happiness. But it doesn't last. It passes. And then, what does the drug addict want? He wants another dose. And you see, the fact is, the addict then needs more drug to produce the same effect. And it goes on like that in a downward spiral. And so Jesus called the riches of worldly things, he called the things of this world thorns. Thorns. They can en envelop people capture people and control people because they are discontent. The Bible calls it covetousness. Not being content with what God gives you. Thinking God has made a mistake. He's made a big mistake. He didn't give me what I wanted to make me happy, so curse God. Discontent. The Bible uh, ranks covetousness being discontent with fornication. The rank, uh, Bible ranks it with all forms of uncleanness. It ranks it with idolatry. And it says of the covetous, they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The Bible calls covetousness being unjust before God. To be unjust before the judge means you're guilty and you will be punished. Well, that's ungodliness. What is godliness? Who are the godly then? Who are the just? Who will stand before God's judgment throne justified? This is the person who puts all of his trust in Jesus Christ alone. The godly person, the Bible says, is the person who trusts that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of God's plan of salvation. He is the fulfillment of the whole Bible. He is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Then in Jesus Christ, everything is yea and amen. Everything is yes from God. For Christ's sake. Because Jesus is God himself who came down, God the Son, sent by God the Father, into the sinful world to live as a human being, to be a human being, live under the law of God, yet keep the law of God perfectly, so that he could offer up his perfect sinless life on the cross and pay for all the sins of the world himself. So that all people could be justified. All could be righteous before God. 
all of their sins washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. The person who believes that and trusts that and holds to that, that's the godly person. And he has the proof of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that this is true. That the one who spoke these promises is the one who rose from the dead. Martin Luther said he had a dream. He had a vision. And in this vision, he said he saw the devil. What he thought was the devil approach him and, and walk toward him with a huge book in his hand. And Luther said, this, this, this being he thought was the devil opened this book and said to him, Martin, in this book are every single sin you've ever committed in your whole life. And he started to read them one by one. Every single sin, thought, word, and deed. He started to read this book of sins of Luther's life. But then Luther held up his hand and said, stop, because here's another book. And he held up the Bible and said, it says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's a godly person. Now, our text says, godliness with contentment is great gain. To have this faith in Christ Jesus is great gain. Jesus called it the pearl of great price, which you should be willing to give up everything to have if it comes to that. This faith in Christ Jesus is such an infinite gift of God if you have this faith in Christ Jesus. And it talks about godliness with contentment. Not as if there's godliness without contentment. There is no such thing. What it's saying is, godliness brings with it contentment. This faith in Christ brings with it contentment. They go together. There's not two kinds of godliness, one with contentment, one without contentment. What this means is, contentment is always a part of true godliness. Godly people will always be content. True christ believers will trust Jesus enough to never question what he does with them in their life. And the Bible gives us many examples of these believers and how they are content. Take, for example, Elijah. The man Elijah in the Bible, God says that for many, many months, God told him to live in a cave, and every day he would be fed by ravens who would bring to him bread and meat in their beaks. And so he lived for many months, and he was content. And then God told him to go to a village, and there he would meet a widow and her son, and he would live with them. And all they had was a jar of oil and a jar of meal. But it never failed. It never ran out. And for months they lived on oil and meal, and Elijah was content. He was a godly man. There's, there's the prophet Jeremiah. We're told that for a long time, all he, he had to eat was one piece of bread a day. But he was content with that. Godliness with contentment, our text tells us. They go together. I trust God for heaven. I trust Jesus Christ for the things of this world too. The true Christ believer is content. He is content with his position in life. Whether it's a salesman or a factory line worker or whether it's a teacher or whatever it is. He is content with his status that God has put him in. He is content with his income. He is content with his spouse. He is content with his material things. 
Paul, the godly man, the apostle Paul, said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer want. That's contentment. That's godliness. Godly person is content because he always remembers the next verse of our text. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The true Christ believer remembers that fact. When you leave this world, when God calls you out of this world, all that will leave is your soul. That's it. Your soul will take nothing, not even your body, with it. So everything that you have in this world is a temporary gift of God. God has entrusted you for a short period of time with certain things of his creation. He has given you these things to use while you're in this world, and you're content with what God, in his infinite wisdom, has decided to entrust you with. Job, in the Bible, said, and this was, by the way, after God had decided to take almost everything away from Job, not only his, his goods, but many of his family, his relatives, he had taken almost everything away from Job, but Job was a godly man. And so he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Godliness with contentment. And so Jesus asks you, why be anxious about the things of this world? Why have worry and concern and doubt about worldly things? Because you brought none of them into this world, and you'll take none of them out. You didn't even bring clothing into this world. Do you remember that? Naked came I out of my mother's womb. I didn't even have clothes. And we will be going out shortly the same way, with nothing. And so the few things needed for our short stay here do not disturb the godly. Little will satisfy the person who knows that we're only here for a short time and our eternal home is heaven. That's where we're looking. That's where our thoughts are. We have long distance vision. We look at the long run. Where will we end up? Not where are we today. Our eyes are focused on the prize, the eternal heaven with God. Food in this life, sure, it's important. God have food to live, as we're studying in Genesis. They have famines. If you don't have food, you die. Shelter, yes, you need a house to live in. You need some, some place to live. Clothing, yes. God knows you need these things. He created you. He created you with these needs. He knows you need these things. And he gives these necessities to the godly. The Bible says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. Again, the Bible says, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Contentment. Contentment. Having enough 
for our body while our soul is reborn, while our soul converts, while our soul regenerates. That's why we're really in this world. That's why we're here for a short time, to come to faith in Jesus. To go from an ungodly person to a godly person. That's why we're here. Not to amass and accumulate great wealth. Unless that be God's will. Now we just read about Solomon. And he wanted, more than anything, this godliness. Make me a godly man, he asked God with wisdom and understanding and judgment between good and bad. So I know the mind of God. But yet God added, after he gave him this wisdom, this faith, God added unto Solomon great wealth. As Jesus would later say, the flowers of the field are arrayed even greater than Solomon in all his glory. Solomon had great wealth, but most importantly, he had godliness. He had faith in the coming Savior. He had that godly wisdom. He trusted God to give him every moment of his life just the right amount. Jesus said, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Your soul is the important thing, Jesus says, not your body. Your soul needs to be born again by faith in Jesus. Contentment, godliness with contentment, trusting God to give you everything you need in just the right amount. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If God is given the proper place, all these other things will take their proper place. The Bible says godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness with contentment is great gain, the Bible says. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out except faith in Christ. I may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.